Okay, so this is a uh, part two of the motor control learning, and this video should be watched after the completion of the star, the mirror drawing star project. So hopefully you're able to complete that. Hopefully you had fun with it. Uh, it's a lot more exciting in class when you have other classmates there and you can kind of compete a little bit. But hopefully what you gained from that mirror drawing experiment was the frustration, the um, the kind of uh, failure component. And but hopefully after a couple trials, you start to kind of as you practice, you were getting more and more used to it. Um, I had a at the end of that video, I kind of showed the or shared the secret, the trick to it in terms of uh, and hopefully that was apparent from the first video that we talked about where you already know how to trace a, uh, a star and what was happening was you were getting visually conflicting information and that visual conflicting information you were processing and trying to perform the task and really the secret was was to turn your visual aspect off just use it as a guide and rely more on the muscle memory or the motor memory that you had from um, from that star drawing aspect because remember what happens is that um, your body can only process so much at once and your brain was getting in the way right your visual stimulation based on this processing you were trying to control it right it was a new environment because it was an inverse image the task was somewhat similar and then you had to rely on your resources and so you were trying to consciously control and visually control that when really what you should have been doing was just kind of letting the brain take over in that subconscious component um, as you saw from the first uh, example to the last example that a lot of these things improved, right? The smoothness and the flow, your line should have gotten straighter. Um, you should be more relaxed to it, uh, not thinking about it so much, and you're a little bit more aware from the air detection. So it's a, it was a, it's a cool little study. It's used quite a bit in a lot of the different um, psychological aspects, like they'll look at your, your ability to perform your impairment with alcohol or not alcohol, different drugs, uh, uh, sleep states, uh, well-fed or less-fed, loud music, and can kind of ch look at your performance. So you're taking a novel activity, uh, making a novel activity out of a known activity. And so based on, did we put some time constraints on you? Were you getting more anxiety? In, in, like in the classroom setting, we're able to see more of this uh, because you have more groups around, more people around, um, loud music. We can put loud noises, distractions, but um, you got a, a little sense of that. So what was happening was some stress, some level of stress was affecting the performance, right? So your learned knowledge was being in, uh, was there, but the execution of that task in terms of your performance was being modified by the stress that was environment. And as our stress levels rise, as our stress levels rise, that should increase our performance, but there gets to a point where too much of a good thing leads to uh, decreases in performance and what happens when you start to get on this end of the graph on the curve here one of the things that starts to happen is you start to get visual changes and so um, you have your when you look straight ahead you have about 100 and 190 200 degrees of vision here and you have your peripheral vision way out here and then you have your central vision here what ends up happening is your pupil starts to dilate and start to let more light in and as it happens you start to get a few things you start to get more blurred vision something called tunnel vision and sometimes people experience visual snow but um, the blurred vision starts to look like this so a crisp clean image and you start to starts to get blurry um, you start to lose your peripheral vision here and you start to focus more just on the central vision and not so much that you'll see these visual changes but your eyes instead of scanning back and forth become focused or fixated on one thing and instead of getting that blurred vision sometimes people get what's called pixelated version uh, vision or this uh, visual snow it's just because so much light's coming in, uh, so increased blood flow, increased anxiety state, your body's trying to take in as much information as possible. Um, you start to get physiological responses as well. You start to get hyperventilation, your breathing changes, your heart rate changes. Um, you know, your task uh, for optimal skill, like if that's why you do a warm up when you work out and you're between 115 and 145 beats per minute, but as your stress levels start to increase, that anxiety, um, you get well beyond that 145 beats a minute, and now your body is in alarm state, survival mode instead of, right? It's, it's a, it's, think of it as a flight or flight. Your body kind of went beyond the fight mode, and now it's in fright mode, and you go from flight to flight to freeze, and you freeze up. So that's kind of the, uh, that's the process that's happening with frustration or when you're put on the spot or in an exam situation. And again, all these things are affected by your preparation, both mental and knowledge and physical and so forth. 
So one of the takeaways we had from the uh, quiet eye video was that this this aspect of like quieting the brain, the silence, more of like this internal focus, this flow, really trying to tap into that subconscious aspect. And in a high anxious environment or a high stress environment, that silence, that moment can start overthinking. And so one of your first strategies for this is to kind of like try to turn off that part of your overthinking aspect and really more just like take a deep breath, relax, and kind of breathe through the, the process. Um, one of the things that is interesting with this whole like flight or flight versus parasympathetic, and I think I mentioned it in the uh, anatomy and physiology video, is that um, your breathing is your basic connection to um, the parasympathetic. And the parasympathetic nervous system is that is the antithesis, the opposite of sympathetic. So the sympathetic nervous system is the flight or flight. The parasympathetic is the rest and recover. And what ends up happening in these um, high performance situations is your sympathetic nervous system is dominating. And we really can't control that. Um, we can with drugs, and we can with, um, if you're some kind of like meditative guru who can levitate, like you could think it by your mind, but the, for most people, breathing becomes the pathway for that. And so that deep chest expansion breathing and the slow exhale is counter to what happens during a sympathetic flight or flight high anxiety, the these short, shallow breaths. And so because our breathing mechanism is both subconscious and conscious in nature, it is kind of the bridge or the window or the, the door that we have to be able to tap into those components of the subconscious. And so this like deep, relaxed breathing becomes our tool for managing. That's why when someone's really aggravated or it's like, take a deep breath, right? And they get upset because you told them to take a deep breath, but don't tell anyone that, but you know the secret to that. So when you get upset, you take a deep breath and take that deep breath and relax and try to calm things down. What you're trying to do is during the, you want to get to this relaxed execution of the skill, right? So it's got to be a practice skill. It's not a new skill, it's something you practiced. And you want to make sure that the communication between the motor and the reasoning areas of the brain, so the subconscious and the conscious decreases. And you want to let the, the just like with that, um, the authors from that original study, you want to let that autonomous robot take over, right? Instead of you trying to visually count how many dots there are, you want the, the hand to be able to choose it for you. The beginner or novice's brain is occupied with like all this like crosstalk, like do I do this, do I should do that, do I do that? And they're trying to translate this information into action. And um, again, it comes back to too much brain interference can make you choke, right? So it's really about getting the brain out of the way. and. All this has to be done beforehand, this preparation, and you have, you have to have trust in your preparation. If you didn't prepare and you're going into it, you're screwed, right? You can't, it's not just like a mental Jedi trick where you're gonna make up for lack of preparation. But even the best prepared experts still have these occasional aspects when they choke, right? Um, stress depletes working memory, right? And so um, the time leading up to the stress, like thinking about an event, so from day one, when you know you have to give a speech, all this is depleting resource, depleting resource, depleting resource, and it can set up for you for performance or choking. There's a, a fantastic book. Um, it's called Flow. Here's the book here. And it, it talks about how we get into these flow states. That we it, These are not just haphazard things that just happen, right? It does occasionally, but these are intentionally created. And that you, if the more you're aware of it, can, can create this more and more. And we're not just talking about having a great workout or having a great run or hitting your performance best on a squat. We're talking about all elements of your life. So an interview, uh, an exam, uh, an entrance exam, uh, all these things that, um, that can affect anything that has to do with performance, whether it's cognitive performance or physical performance, all operate on the same mechanism of having to deal with conscious and subconscious information. So a fantastic book. Um, I highly recommend it for um, more strategies and getting the flow state. For me to have to teach you this in one module of one class from one semester, I think it's incomplete, but I think planting the seed and starting it now, I think will set the tone for the rest of your academic uh, career. Um, the book talks about getting into flow state and the best moments in people's lives are when you're stretched to the limit, not when you're doing routine or mundane tasks, but when you're trying to accomplish something difficult, but if we look um, on that flow curve, I'm just gonna go here one slide. When you're in this range here, not when you're here disengaged or when you're overwhelmed, you might have some, some bad memories here, 
but some of the best memories of your life or your accomplishment, your work, your school, even when you're having fun, when you play your sports, your hobbies are here, right? And so getting there, like the moments of flow, that's what we want to try to get to, right? So this is not just doing better on an exam or doing better in your sport. This is getting most out of life. Um, we look at this graph here. This is also from the book Flow, and it looks at this, this thing called Flow Channel. And um, if you play any type of game on your phone or console game or video game or board games for that matter, that um, like the quote unquote free games, they operate within this flow channel. They try to get you here, right? If a game is too easy, you get the game when you start at level, you start at level zero and within two minutes you're level 10, you're going to get bored and you're going to quit, right? If the game gets in and you're all these people are pay for play and there's no opportunity for you to get in there and you're just getting your butt kicked every time, you're going to get your butt kicked over and over again and you're going to quit. So the games are designed to, to be just challenging enough and just addictive enough so that you continue to play them in this flow channel. So games are designed that way. Life, you play the game of life, your own game. You have to play it that way as well. You kind of have to find ways to conquer this anxiety deal with boredom so sometimes sometimes you just have choice where like i ain't gonna do that and i ain't gonna do that i'm gonna do this but sometimes you're stuck doing a task and you have to find ways to mentally overcome this anxiety or boredom the challenge here so um i'll look at this next slide here again from the book flow and you kind of see the different emotional uh, components that are connected with these adjectives but um again it's it's superimposed same aspect here you want to be in this flow channel which is here um but you don't want to have that over arousal or under arousal. You kind of want to be, this is like your control, happy, confident. This is where you're content and can lead to boredom and relaxation. Um, you don't want to be overstressed either. You want to be in this happy, like just enough, like that Goldilocks principle. Like this is Papa Bear, this is Mama Bear, and that's Baby Bear right there. Just enough to keep you going, keep you focused, and keep going. So that book flow really gets into um, how, you know, what these different aspects look at and how to get in that state. But basically it comes down to is your, your body, your, your, you as a human are motivated by moving away from pain and towards pleasure. And if too much pain, you're going to succumb to it. Too much pleasure, you're going to get bored from it. And you want to have that like just that little bit of roughness where it's not too hot, not too cold aspect. Now how does this apply to exams? So this is a great website, uh, collegeinfogeek.com, and uh, there's an article on there about getting into flow. And if you click on this link and follow it, um, you can get a lot more detail. I'm just going to um, recap, recap it here and kind of use it as talking points. But this is a great website just for any type of like academic study aspect, uh, test-taking strategies, anything related to college, both two-year community college and um, four-year. So when we look at test strategy now, so how do you do well in tests? Because that's how most um, classes grade are on exams. Um, these are the three aspects that uh, drive the, um, the your, your poor performances. Fear of the unknown, your fear of inadequacy or not being prepared, and then fear of the stakes. And you can kind of control one and two. You have somewhat control over number three, but hopefully you have a good enough uh, professor or, or teacher that has things set up a little bit better. And I'll, and I'll go through each one of these one by one. So the first one, fear of the unknown. Um, your strategy here is like, what, what's going to be on the exam? I have no idea, right? And your goal is to try to make it as known as possible. So during your studying, most people just study and they, re, they try to memorize a bunch of stuff. But when you're studying, you should be trying to predict test questions. And I, I can't tell you how powerful this aspect is here. Um, Instead of making note cards and taking notes and recopying notes, which I think is a good thing, uh, you should be coming up with quiz questions. And if you had a study partner, you guys should be coming up with test questions and write them back and forth to each other. As I'll tell you a secret as a, as a faculty member. Um, well, here's two secrets. You either have lazy faculty members that use publisher content. So what you could do is go skip to number E and look for old tests or um, a lot of publisher content is already online. You can come and download that. So if a faculty member is lazy enough not to write their own content, it's easy to find old tests on exam. Um, I am not that, so you can't do that with my tests if you take further classes with me. But I'll tell you how I approach writing test questions is that based on conversations that I have in class or book content, I'll read through based on what I need to cover in terms of learning objectives. 
and I'll select like, do I do you need to know how to apply that or just memorize it? But it's usually in the application component, and I will generate test questions from that. Um, a lot of times I have students that will write um, quizzes and notes, and I, I'll end up picking like two or three good students in class, and I want to see what they got from the lecture. So instead of me fo focusing on what they need to know, I also kind of put away, aside my, my expert bias and see what a novice is getting from that information, and sometimes I'll write test questions from that. So the takeaway from this is when you're predicting test questions is you should be trying to come up with quizzes. How would I ask that? Not just do I, how do I, what do, do I just know what X, Y, and Z mean, but how do I apply that and how would I write that in a test question? And it's not as easy as you think, but studying for exams in that approach, I think that covers like 90% of it. You're, you're no longer just surprised by this, like, oh, wow, I didn't know that, or I knew that information, but you're looking at the application. So we'll move on to number C there. Um, try to recreate test questions, right? If the environment and the stress and the pressure is a factor in your performance, don't just study in a calm, quiet, soothing environment. Go into a bright room uh, with other people and try to take a quiz and time yourself and see how you do under pressure. There's this whole aspect of what's called recall and um, the ability to retrieve information and recall it is more powerful than just rote memorization, looking at things over and over again. Um, so definitely um, take advantage of that recall aspect. And uh, a lot of people overlook uh, option D, just asking what's going to be on the test, right? Like study guides or but like how are they going to ask their test questions? And a good faculty, a good instructor will tell you how, to strat how they'll strategize for that, how their test questions are being developed and so forth. Um, I think I, I mentioned I got ahead of myself here, but for option B here, predict, or I'm sorry, E, C, retest, recreate the test questions. Uh, is practice under stress, right? Make sure that you are um, doing the quizzes and exams in somewhat stressful environments, right? So you're not broken down when you have to do it when it counts. Uh, number two is fear of inadequacy, so not prepared. And again, there's nothing you can do for lack of preparation. You have to prepare. You have to put the work in there. But don't do it two days before or a night before the exam. This should be happening ongoing process, two weeks or so. Um, prepare and the grade will take care of itself. Not the night before, but a strategized, disciplined, utilizing time, uh, reviewing your na notes and then know your gaps, right? And this is the thing where you know your gaps to study actively. Make the quizzes, this whole recall, retrieval aspect. And I would say the most important thing you can do is try to teach it to somebody and not even somebody, something. Give a lecture on it to your dog, to your plant, to your wall, to your parent, to your significant other. It doesn't matter. But when you just stay in your head and you just read things, sometimes you and your mind, because it's because you're so familiar with it, you become used to it. And you remember, it's not practice makes perfect. It's perfect practice. And unless you know your faults or your shortcomings, until you actually try to explain it to someone, that's when you really know if you know it or not. And this ability, so um, like this is the highlight in here is teaching to someone or trying to get it in a way where you can share that information is the most powerful way to study for an exam, most powerful way. Um, if you are stressed out, like you're not, and you still have some concerns, um, air out your worries. Write down like before the exam or the night before, like write down like all the things that you're worried about. Just write it down, download it from your brain so it's not infiltrating your thoughts during the, the exam itself. Um, this is a book that I require in my functional anatomy class, and it has nothing to do with anatomy. It's written by a chemist who teaches chemistry, and um, her argument, Sandra McGuire, is that it's not so much um, are, you, are you not able to perform, are you not smart enough, but students that fail miserably, repeatedly, like F and D students in science-based classes or any classes, um, it's not because they're not ca capable. It's not because it's a shitty instructor. It's because they're looking at it in the wrong way. And what this is looking at is this pyramid aspect of Bloom's taxonomy. And what ends up happening is in, in high school, you're asked to uh, remember some stuff and maybe a little bit of understanding. So can you pick out the right answer from a multiple choice question, right? And the reason why I use this in the functional anatomy class is that anatomy and physiology, as I share with you, has one of the highest DFW rates where it, um, almost 50% almost of the people that take anatomy and phys fail or withdraw or don't do so well, right? And anatomy and physiology is not hard. It's not hard. There's no calculation. That's not like chemistry or physics. 
Um, there's no reactions that you have to, there's no formula, there's no math, there's nothing. It's just remembering a bunch of stuff. And that's the problem is that students will take an exam or they'll study for an exam and they'll spend all this time just remembering and trying to understand things, right? When they go and sit and take the exam, because it's a college level course, the questions, same content, are at this level, analyze and apply. So when you're at this analyze and apply level, you are um, trying to apply what you know. So instead of, uh, instead of just trying to recall it, you now have to utilize it. So not where is the radial nerve, but if the radial nerve is, if you get stabbed in the arm, what functions would you lose if, uh, or what nerve would be damaged if you lost the ability to flex finger four, five, and six? Now there's no six, but I'm just talking now. So that's where the disconnect comes from. Is that the, and this is the, this is the statement that I hear all the time. I studied for hours and I still failed on the exam. And it's not because you studied the wrong content. You studied the right, same content. You just look at it from the different lens. Instead of looking at the lens of just remembering and understanding it, you should be looking at it the lens for how do I analyze and apply it. This comes back, circles back to the writing test questions, trying to teach it to someone because you're going to be at these higher levels of understanding instead of these remedial levels of understanding. And that's where students have the problem is they get stuck down at these remedial levels and they never advance. This is what you had to do in high school and grade school, right? And now you get to college and you're being asked to do this for your first two or three years of college and then your last year or two, you're up here. And this is where students fail to make the, the connection. And it's not because they're not capable. It's not because of the content's too hard. It's because they're stuck at these levels and they need to get up here. So this book here is fantastic in teaching you how to do that. And I think it's $11. It's a, it's a very affordable book. And I, I highly recommend it for climbing that Bloom's taxonomy. And sometimes just talking about this is enough to get you in that aspect. And if you're planning on sitting for personal training, physical therapy, licensing exam, um, these questions, uh, this comes up quite a bit in terms of are you just recalling stuff or are you applying things? And you have to be able to do this at this level or you're not going to do well in your licensing or your certification exam. Um, this just talks about the writing about the worries and looking at the um, just it just basically gives you an out like right before the exam. Just write down what you're worried about and it kind of just eases your brain a little bit and uh, or talk about it to someone sometimes when you just you're thinking about something over and you just end up talking to someone or write about it uh, if you're an introvert you're probably going to write about it if you're extrovert talk to someone about it and you realize that it's not as bad as you thought it was uh, number three the last one is fear of the stakes um, you got to detach from the outcome right there's only so much that you can control from this and yes, it's kind of stressful if you have three exams for the semester and your first exam you failed and your last two exams and this makes up 100% of your grade. I got to tell you, that's more poor design in the, in the faculty and the instructor. But um, it, sometimes you just, there's not much you can do about it. But you kind of have to relax a little bit and um, uh, realize that you're not going to lose your life over it, right? You're, you might have to retake a class. But hopefully you're in a, a situation where you have ability to kind of make up work. And, and I'm sure if you reach out to the professor or faculty member, they'll be able to uh, work with you on it. But um, this here, this ability to relax, is uh, crucial if it's a high stake type situation. But if you come in and you do these first two things, you, you recreate the environment and you're prepared, um, it doesn't matter. It won't matter. So that's it. That's kind of the nutshell for the test taking strategies here. Um, but again, just be aware that the psychological temperament only determines so much is that you have to be prepared, right? You can try to recreate stressful environments. You can learn how to meditate like a guru and relax, but you have to be prepared. And learning how to study through teaching yourself how to learn is uh, crucial. There's some great information on that, 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 uh, um, that uh, College Info Geek. And, um, you know, the last couple slides here I have is about how do you reverse engineer everything we talked about, right? Um, if stress can affect performance, right? There are things that can that can negatively affect them in performance. Um, can't, do you think that things would be able to work in reverse? And that's absolutely true, right? So when we look at um, how do we reverse our study environment to make it where we can perform better, right? Where the, our study environment is actually worse than the testing environment. Um, you're basically trying to purposely increase difficulties in your study aspect. And these are the four here. And, and this applies both to 
motor skills and to cognitive skills. So we'll go each of these one by one. So you're going to vary the condition of learning. So where we choose to study or practice or what we choose to study or practice. So um, in this, uh, there's an experiment that they did where they had a beanbag group and they had one group that practiced at four feet, right? And the goal is to shoot at four feet and the other group practiced at three feet and five feet. Um, which group do you think did better? And it was actually group two that practiced at three and five feet that did better. So they had the same amount of time. Group one just had the same task over and over again, rep repeated it, repeated it, repeated it. Group two repeated it two tasks, three feet and five feet. So they had to switch back and forth. I remember our very first lecture and the very first slide of this lecture where you had the cognitive process and your body can only process 50 to 100 bits per second. Every time you switch a task, your body has to recalibrate and get back on a swing of things. And the more conscious, the more you have to think about it, the better the learning process, the more difficult it becomes. So when you're studying a, a topic, let's say you have three chapters that you have to study, most people would ap apply approach it serially. Well, they'll, they'll, pre they'll, they'll study chapter one, get it all done with. Then chapter two, and then chapter three, and that's it. What you really should be doing is you should be bouncing them back between chapter one, chapter three, chapter two, back to chapter one, back to chapter three. It's a longer process. Remember, we're not talking about cramming the night before the exam. We're talking about really understanding the material, but breaking it up and changing the study um, content or what you're doing. Let's say you have addition and then you get it from a division back to addition. Don't do the same thing over and over again. Don't create boredom with your studying. That change, that novelty makes it more exciting, makes it more relevant to the brain, makes it more meaningful to you better retention. Uh, number two is you want to space the study sessions. So um, you actually want to give time in between a little bit right before you start to forget, right? Think about if someone gave you a phone number and what do you do right away? You start repeating it, 555-2323. And if you give a little bit more space between it, you actually forget it. You, you have the false belief that you know it and then that's it, you move on to something else. But then when you go back and revisit it again, you uh, have to like look it up again. And when you forget someone's name a couple times or forget someone's number, hopefully by the second or third time, now you know it, right? So part of learning includes forgetting. And you don't want to forget everything, but you do want to give some space in between. And so if you make flashcards, which I think is a great study tool, instead of just going through them over and over again, flashcards that you already get, take them out of the rotation and then revisit them again a couple days later, or a week later, and try to give longer space intervals between your practice sessions, practicing other things to kind of push the envelope a little bit so you can retrieve things. So you, you don't want to, you don't want to cram everything into one session. You want to break it up into smaller groups, um, little things at a time and give some space in between to kind of challenge that time flow. And, and you don't want to forget everything, but let's say you have content and you forget like 90% of it. I would say that would be ideal because then you have to go back, revisit it, and get that 10% back again. Um, you don't want to wait too long where you forgot everything because then you're starting over, but definitely giving some space in between is, is key. Um, I talked about this earlier, and this is the whole retrieving rather than reviewing. So this whole recall, retrieval, instead of just looking over your notes and saying, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it, what ends up happening is you end up biasing the information that you already know. And so then the only time you realize you don't know it is when you actually take the exam and you, you're like, oh, I didn't know that, and you get the feedback. But trying to recall things, for instance, like teaching it to someone or taking a quiz or getting a blank sheet of paper and writing everything you know about that particular topic, then compare that to your notes and see what you missed, right? That gives you more positive or focal feedback in terms of you can focus on your weaknesses instead of just relying on your strengths. That's where another problem students take when they take exams or classes is they focus too much on what they already know because it's comfortable. Athletes do it too. Like they're really good at shooting free throws, so they're going to they're gonna do that instead of their side shots or their whatever skill they need to work on. So this retrieval versus reviewing, and I, I have a, look, a link. I, I, there's another book that I really like. Um, it's called Powerful Teaching, and it gets into this whole like recall retrieval but if you do any kind of little search on retrieval practice or recall for learning there's a lot of information a lot of good simple information that you can really easy stupid tasks that you can do that will make huge game changers in your um in your performance but again this whole retrieval is ba tied back to that teaching it the taking the quiz quizzes trying to come up with test questions and and so forth 
And the last thing is kind of related to number two where you're spacing is this interleaving. Um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the varying the condition of learning is the interleaving in terms of um, trying to go back and forth between subjects or content areas. So let's say you have an English and a math exam, study both at the same time. Again, anytime that you have to enter, um, go back and forth, alternate between one and the other, that forces the brain back into um, study mode again, more of alertness, and gets out of that boredom. So that's those are the tricks there. You're creating these, like in your study sessions, you're creating these like desirable difficulties to make things a little bit more challenging so that your brain has to work a little bit more, but your the outcome of it is huge impact. So a little bit of more difficulty for a huge a performance gain. And then this last quote, are you studying for tomorrow or for later when it matters, right? So if you're in a situation where you have to cram, then you're going to you're gonna disregard everything I said. But if you are taking your studies or your training or anything you're doing, seriously, you're going to take it from that approach. So that's just the starting of the seed for these study strategies. I would definitely check out those books, uh, Flow, um, Teach Yourself How to Learn, and uh, powerful teaching they're great um, the powerful teaching you don't even have to buy the book you can go online there's quite a bit of resources that are there but i would definitely buy that book um teach yourself how to learn yeah, this book here back up to the slides this one right here great book eleven dollars so well, that's it for module five and six for the uh, study strategy stress motor control and learning